it's a pleasure to welcome you to our conversation with the Obermeier Award winner, Zweitzeugen. My name is Miriam Bistovic and I'm the director of Berlin operations of the Leo Beck Institute, New York, Berlin. Many of you may already know about us or about the Obermeier Awards or about our colleagues from Wine the Circle or even Zweitzeugen, but please let me give a brief introduction to those of you who have never heard about us um, might not be too comfortable about the background information. <laughs> so the Leo Beck Institute was founded about 70 years ago in order to preserve the cultural legacy of German speaking Jewry. It was founded by German Jewish immigrants who barely escaped the Nazi clutches. And it was founded simultaneously in Israel, in Jerusalem, in UK, London, and in the United States in New York. Since its founding, the LBI New York grew into one of the most important archives for German Jewish history. It was one of the founding partners of the Center for Jewish History in New York. And up until today, it houses more than 80,000 books, tens of thousands of photographs, several thousands of objects and artworks, and an overwhelming amount of letters, diaries, memoirs, and documents, all of those who document and address nearly all aspects of German Jewish life, culture, history, and everyday life over the past 600 years. Nearly 85% of those documents have been now digitized. So you can go on our website, browse, and view about 4.8 million documents online without any kind of registration or login. So much about that. But being an archive is always more than just dealing about the past, but it's also something that has to do with the present and the future. That when the Obermeier German Jewish History Awards were founded by Arthur Obermeier in 2000, the Leo Beck Institute became one of the cooperational partners and co-sponsors of the awards and we've been in close touch ever since. The awards itself are given to non-Jewish Germans who have made outstanding contributions in preserving the memory and culture of Jews in their local surroundings. And these awards were given in order to encourage and recognize the work that they've been doing for almost all their lives and bring international attention to those who have been diligent working on these fields. Those awards are annually awarded in the Abgordnen House, which is a place where the Berlin Parliament is residing and thus have widespread recognition by the political scene in Berlin and Germany. So to put it bluntly, why am I here? Besides being the director of Berlin operations of the Leo Beck Institute, I'm also a jury member of the Obermeier Awards. Well, it's quite a newly appointed position for me. I started in 2022, but my own involvement with the Obermeier stayed back until, well, 2015, if I'm not mistaken, when I was approached whether it would be possible to put together a booklet for Arthur Obermeier because the family, previous overdies, and fellows and friends of the Obermeiers wanted to put in a tribute for him. And that's not only because he was a founder of the Obermeier Awards, but also because he was a heart and soul of those awards. And for many awardees, the first person to even recognize their achievements and the value of their diligent work. So when I was approached, I was not really sure where I was heading into it. And after a brief time of just Looking back at my experience as an editor, I thought, okay, that would be coming in handy. But then I was meeting the Obermeyers, I was meeting fans, I was meeting previous awardees, and we started exchanging countless messages, letters and phone calls. And this vivid exchange never stopped. So when Joel came up with the idea to expanding the Obermeyer Foundation's work to combat prejudice, racism, xenophobia, and bigotry in all kinds, by supporting grassroots movements in Germany and the US, I was all ears. And in 2019, these initial thoughts were given some kind of form. They became what is now known the nonprofit organization of Widen the Circle, 
one small, it was all about the network, the people, and that tremendously important work that is being undertaken on a grassroots level and locally. So there's a lot to tell about it, but that's for Joel to do. And as mentioned, I'm a member of the Obermeyer jury, and it's my honor and also my duty to just say a few words about one of the Avadis, which I had the privilege of getting to know, and that's Zweitzeugen, which can be loosely translated as being secondary witnesses. And we'll focus on this conversation. Roughly 12 years ago, Zweitzeugen start, uh, started as a small study project. By now, more than 130 volunteers and staff have documented 37 livestock of German-speaking survivors of the Holocaust. Since those contemporary witnesses will no longer be able to speak for themselves, the survivors empower a younger generation to preserve and share their biographies. The focus of, or better, the focus of Zweitzeugen lies on educating and reaching out a younger audience, regardless of their educational, social, or cultural backgrounds. And over the, in over the last 10 years, they reached about 21,000 children and adolescents with at least 23 projects being undertaken by those young Zweitzeugen in 2022, which is really impressive if you think about it. So without any kind of further delay, it's my pleasure to hand over the mic to Joel. And so Joel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Miriam, it has been a great pleasure uh, to have you as a partner, a thought partner, and help, and somebody uh, who's really seen us uh, evolve over time. Um, and, you know, Leo, people of Leo Beck have been involved in the award since the very beginning, uh, 23 years ago. So thank you. Uh, I'm very excited that we get to join with the Leo Beck Institute for these conversations with Obermeyer Award winners. Today's is our first one, uh, and it'll be with two leaders from Zweitzeugen, uh, or secondary witnesses. Um, and I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy it. I certainly did. I certainly will. Um, on April 19th, we'll have another event uh, with an award winner, in this case with Stefan Schirmer, who's one of the leaders of Ente Baghdad. That's an amateur soccer club that also does really good remembrance work. Um, and, and they also work with refugees and immigrants I'm uh, very interesting with them because soccer is really a, a mode that can reach audiences that are often hard to reach. Um, let me, anyway, so that, that please think about coming to that event. I think it'll be great. Um, now I just want to say a few things about Widen the Circle. Miriam, thank you for that introduction. It means I need to say less. Um, so here's my quick indirect introduction. Widen the Circle has offices in the United States and Germany, and we work with people who uncover history. Uh, history related to oppression and bigotry like Jewish history and the Holocaust in Germany, and the legacy, or for example, the legacy of slavery in the United States. And we use lessons from that history to create a more just world today. And we really do that in three ways. Uh, the first is that each year we give out Obermeyer Awards at the Berlin Parliament, which is something that Miriam talked about extensively. Uh, second, uh, we also mentioned this, Widen the Circle has developed and nurtured a network of German activists who do remembrance projects and use remembrance to fight modern prejudice in Germany. And our third area, which is the newest one, is where we build bridges among educators and activists and thought leaders in the US and Germany who are dealing with historic legacies and injustice. And we bring them together so they can learn from one another um, and to have more impact. Uh, we do this through virtual events and particularly through an immersive education program that brings Americans to German, Germany each June. Um, so that's what we do. Now I think we should hear from our speakers, but we'll hear from them in just one moment. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to the organization site, so I can give you a general introduction, uh, who are recipients of a 2023 Obermeyer Award, and we have a short film about them that I'd like to show you now.
it no sound coming be, through. We might be having technical difficulties, so sorry about that. Um, yep. Looks like we have to sort of rewind and uh, do it with sound. So uh, for everybody who's listening, uh, thank you for the comments about uh, sound. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in doing events is that we always leave a little bit of extra time uh, for technical difficulties. So I think we will figure this out and we will uh, run the film again. Uh, and I'm just holding off with one of my teammates. Macht junge Menschen stark sich gegen Antisemitismus und andere Diskriminierungsformen einzusetzen. I can hear that. Hier, indem wir die unglaublich bewegenden und besonderen Lebensgeschichten von Holocaust. Uh, uh, except that you're not sharing. Ich Stelle weiter erzählen an junge Menschen. So we can't see it. Wir haben die Erfahrung gemacht, dass diese. Almost there. We want to see both hear it and see it. Both, both are good things to do. Zweizeug e.V. macht junge Menschen stark, sich gegen Antisemitismus und andere Diskriminierungsformen einzusetzen. Und das machen wir, indem wir die unglaublich bewegenden und besonderen Lebensgeschichten von Holocaust-Überlebenden an ihrer Stelle weitererzählen an junge Menschen. Denn wir haben die Erfahrung gemacht, dass diese besonderen Geschichten den Kindern und Jugendlichen einen Zugang zu dieser Zeit geben, dass sie ihnen ganz viel Wissen über diese Zeit mitgeben, aber vor allen Dingen, dass sie sie ermutigen, sich einzusetzen. <laughs> Zweizeug e.V. macht yeah. junge Menschen stark, sich gegen Antisemitismus und andere Diskriminierungsformen einzusetzen. Und das machen wir, indem wir die unglaublich bewegenden und besonderen Lebensgeschichten von Holocaust-Überlebenden an ihrer Stelle weitererzählen an junge Menschen. Denn wir haben die Erfahrung gemacht, dass diese besonderen Geschichten den Kindern und Jugendlichen einen Zugang zu dieser Zeit geben dass sie ihnen ganz viel Wissen über diese Zeit mitgeben, aber vor allen Dingen, dass sie sie ermutigen, sich einzusetzen für eine Gesellschaft, die sich ganz lautstark macht gegen Antisemitismus und gegen andere Formen von Diskriminierung. We created the word Zweitzeugen, which you could translate with secondary witness. The meaning is that we, as we listen, we, as we dive into their stories and we dive into what happened during the time of the, of the Shoah, of the Holocaust in World War II, that is how we become secondary witnesses. As such, we can work and um, tell these stories to others. Das, das wirklich äh, Unglaubliche bei den zwei Zeugen ist, dass nicht einfach nur die Geschichte einer Person quasi vorgelesen wird, sondern da, dass sie wirklich versuchen, deren Vita zu verstehen, deren Gedanken zu verstehen, mit anderen Worten, sich wirklich in diese Person herein äh, zu versetzen. Und mein Vater war äh, sehr, sehr nicht nur froh, sondern auch erleichtert geradezu, dass er über die zwei Zeugen Multiplikatoren gefunden hat, die seine... Lebensgeschichte äh, nun mehr weitertragen können an der jüngeren Generation. I was very impressed by their goal that they wanted to keep those stories alive. I mean, who is going to tell my story when I can't anymore? Und deswegen ist es so ein besonderes Geschenk, glaube ich, wenn jemand die persönlichen, die ganz persönlichen Erlebnisse und Geschichten mit einem teilt. Das ist wahnsinnig berührend. Die Geschichten zeigen vor allem Menschen. Sie zeigen Menschen, die ein ganz normales Leben hatten, wie unsere SchülerInnen auch, die in diesem äh, Raum sitzen. Und sie können sich ja identifizieren an manchen Stellen. Und das ist etwas, was für sie unglaublich wertvoll ist, wo sie schon mal so merken, okay, warum habe ich vielleicht ein Vorurteil? Warum gibt es vielleicht ein Stereotyp? Oder ähm, warum grenze ich jetzt vielleicht eine Person aus, wenn sie doch auch nur ein Mensch ist und vielleicht auch sehr ähnliche Interessen hat wie ich, aber ich das gar nicht weiß? Für mich war das Ausschlaggebende, zu hören, dass, also dieses Lebendige, dass man von anderen Leuten hört, wie das Leben da war. 
dass man mitbekommt, dass es genau solche Stories wie Eli Sheva gab, die fliehen mussten. Okay, warum mussten die fliehen? Wie kam das dazu? Wie haben die sich von ihren Liebsten getrennt? Und wie haben die kommuniziert, wenn sie kommunizieren konnten? Und solche Fragen haben einen immer weiter angetrieben. Ich glaube, was unserer Gesellschaft im Allgemeinen einfach fehlt, ist äh, Kommunikation und mehr Zusammenhalt. Und das wird, also beides wird in diesem Workshop halt einfach gestärkt. Aber entspannender wird es, wenn wir irgendwann von der Geschichte weggehen und schauen, okay, so sah Antisemitismus damals aus. Aber das war ja nicht nur eine Zeit, die von 33 bis 45 ähm, behandelt, in der Zeit, wo es dann Antisemitismus gab, sondern Antisemitismus gab es lange Zeit vorher und die gab es auch heute noch. Und wie hat sich der gewandelt? Wie kann man Antisemitismus erkennen? Und was kann man vielleicht auch dagegen tun? Here you and I are. It's not our fault that that happened. We were not there. You don't have the responsibility for that, because that's often a question. Am I responsible? Well, you were not there. But you know what? You and I, we are responsible that this will not be forgotten. So that is our responsibility. That is what we share. And this is what we can do. Zweit Zeugen is my best storyteller and tell the story to others. Zweitzeugen, I hope everybody knows by now what Zweitzeugen is, those who tell our stories, who go to schools and give workshops. Ich muss sagen, als das Projekt sich dem Ende geneigt hat, waren wir alle, alle extrem stolz auf uns, denn wir Jugendliche sollten versuchen, das Geschichtliche, die Vergangenheit nicht dabei zu belassen, sondern auch für uns heute in die Gegenwart und in der Zukunft weiterzutragen. Ich glaube, wenn ich bei uns ins Team gucke, ähm, sind das alles Menschen, die sich von einer Überlebensgeschichte haben inspirieren lassen, berühren lassen, die aber vor allen Dingen daran glauben, dass wir in einer Gesellschaft leben, die Menschen, egal welcher Religion, aber auch egal welcher Sexualität, welche Herkunft, einfach akzeptiert. Wenn ich überlege, wofür stehen die 120 Ehrenamtlichen bei uns im Verein, dann ist das eine tolerante, akzeptierende Gesellschaft. Well, our vision is that every person in Germany and especially young people will become second witnesses as well. And a second witness is being, that means to be a person who listened and who understands how important remembrance is and how important it is to take a stand. I'm so happy that everyone was able to see that film. I'm particularly happy that we really did get you to see that film, so that's great. Um, maybe we, I think we should go ahead and meet the people. So uh, let me welcome Ruth Ann and Nina, who will join me on screen. There we go, hey Ruth Ann. Uh, so um, let's get, bring up Nina as well, and then I'll introduce you both. Hello, Nina, good to see you. Um, Ruth Ann Dahm is one of the managing directors and co-founders of Zeitzeugen. She is joining us from Essen. I hope I said that right. Yes, good. Perfect. All right, we're working on it. You're and, good. <laughs> um, uh, Nina Taubenreuter is a man, also managing director of Zeitzeugen, and she is joining us from Berlin. Hello, Nina. Hello, everybody. Yes. Thanks for the. Oh, my pleasure. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, I thought we should start out uh, hearing a little bit about each of you personally, if we could. Um, and so I'll ask you both in turn, but I'll start with you, maybe Ruthann. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk very briefly about how you and how and why you got involved in this work? Um, yeah, sure. So first of all, I want to thank you for having us. Uh, we are so honored that we are uh, that we won the Obermeyer Award. Thank you so much, and thank you for this night, and or for us, it's night for you today. So thank you for listening. But of course. Um, how did I get involved? So I guess there are two parts of the story. One, of course, is an official story, how we founded our association. But all of us know that we all have a personal story, how we got involved. And it took me many years to understand why I actually always, as I remember, always was very interested in the time of the Holocaust and in survivor stories. And for a long time, I couldn't point it to any a special event or moment, but at some point I realized that it actually was an old 
childhood memory which had a very lasting effect on me and I just want to share a very short personal story but um, I was eight years old and uh, one thing I would like to say is that um, what I didn't know at that point is that I'm actually Jewish as well and I didn't know my mom is from the United States my dad is from Germany mm -hmm. and my mother's family um, well my my grandmother married a Jew and she when she was a teenager so before she met him and before she married him she was a babysitter in a family of a rabbi and she was so inspired by this family and by about Judaism that she converted to Judaism hmm. so I learned when I was eight uh, that I actually um, am a Jew as well <laughs> You, you, and, you, mean, you mean a Jew by blood, though, right? You were grow, you grew up in with a different religious context, right? Exactly, a Christian yeah, okay. religion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So until that point, I didn't know anything about it. But what happened when I was eight years old? I came home from school, mm -hmm. and I pressed the doorbell, and um, you all know an intercom. I think you call it an intercom. Where yeah, you're, you've got it. That's yeah, right. Okay. Yep. So mom, my mom, it's my mom saying, who's there? And I didn't say my name. Instead, mm. I feel embarrassed about it today. I said, Heil Hitler. And um, I was eight. I didn't know what I was saying. And it was the first time in my life that my mom didn't open the door through the intercom. She actually came down and she took me into the house, into the apartment. And we sat down at the dining room table. And we had a very long conversation, which I will never forget. You have to know that my mom always, I knew, of course, was from the States. I never was afraid to that point that my mom would ever leave us. But mm. my mom, mom told me at that point what happened years ago in Germany. And she told me that if it happened again, she would leave. She would go. And it was so shocking for me, realizing how big the impact would be, how my mom would just leave everything and just go with the suitcase as fast as possible. Um, as my mom also, or I also realized that if it happened again today, it also would happen to me, to my two older brothers, to my whole family. And I think it was one of these key moments where something happened to me and unconsciously, I was just always interested. And a second key moment was when I was between my bachelor and master's studies. I was 22 years old and I spent half a year in the United States in New York. I was an intern with Amnesty International and the human rights organization. And sure. it was just a very powerful time for me too, because I was working with all these, oh gosh, inspiring people, making mm -hmm. a change, being mm -hmm. so enthusiastic and passionate about what they were doing. Right. And I came home with the belief that, hey, here I am and I can do something and I can do a change. And yeah. it was clear to me that if I do a change, it would be an education. And then I actually met Zara and Anna, who I founded our yeah, co-founders. Co that's right. Exactly. And um, we were shocked by the fact that we didn't know a lot about survivors who lived through the Holocaust, who survived. And we didn't know what actually happened after 1945, hmm. like in our school uh, education, you always look at the time actually pretty much between 1938, 39, and 1945. And then it's like over. <laughs> but the question, like, what actually happened to the survivors and what happened, what happened afterward? Yeah. yeah and, and anti Semitism today, we, we had no idea. We didn't have a clue and we felt embarrassed. We felt embarrassed to live in a country in Germany, which caused this and not knowing how the survivors are doing today. Yeah. And actually we learned that many of them are not doing well at all. Many of them are living below the poverty level. It was not possible for everybody to learn to love again, learn to trust again, to go back to school and, and, and get your education back, you know? That's, yeah. You and, can't and, take that for granted. So that were many things we learned. And that's, and right, that's when you started collecting essentially Yes. Uh, survivor stories and figuring out how to, how to uh, empower people with them. Great. Exactly. I, I want to turn to Nina in a second. I just wanted sure. to say before we do, for anybody who has a question at any point in here, we will have a question and answer portion at the end. We'll, we'll even go longer if we need to. Please put your questions in the chat. 
we'll keep a track of all of them. Uh, uh, so anytime you have a question, please, please drop it in there. If we can answer it on in the chat, we will, but probably um, more of them will come up toward the end. Okay, let's go to Nina. I know, Nina, your story is a little bit different. Um, I'm just, yeah, I'm just wondering if you can just give us a brief version of how you got started in this work. If I remember correctly, it's related to um, a realization you had in a hotel room, if I've got exactly. that right. Exactly. So uh, my, my career, my entire story is totally different from what Ruth Ann just shared. Uh, I used to work and I had my career in the digital economy. And I used to work for American companies like AOL, Time Warner. And it was, uh, it, it, it was a good, it, it were good jobs and good, a good career at all. And in my free time, I always used to um, try my hand and help in social projects. And especially uh, when the refugee crisis happened in 2015, I was very involved in the work at the shelters. And uh, one day I was on a business trip and I was in my hotel room. It was very big, very luxurious. And I realized it is much bigger, <laughs> my very own hotel room, uh, compared to the room that eight refugees were sharing in the shelter I've just been a few days before. And that was the moment when I decided I can't stand this big difference anymore. And uh, so I decided to quit my job originally and try my hand in the social area. Yeah. And, uh, and from and then on, I was, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and that's when you got involved more with refugees, uh, with work that had a, a kind of a parallel to Zweitzeugen, yes? Exactly. So I worked in a, in a program where young refugees uh, shared their very personal story and stories, actually, in German schools, in, st in front of classes, in front of same ages. And that was so powerful. And that was the moment when I realized how powerful a story, a life story can be, uh, the, the change of perspective can be. And this, let's call it the, it could have been me moment you have when you hear stories from others. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And actually, uh, what's interesting, I think, Ruth Ann, I feel like uh, the first story you told us had a little bit of a, it could have been me moment mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. So yeah, um, this is a similarity, I would say. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, I, I hear it. Um, I want to talk briefly, since we saw a little bit about Zaitugin already, I wanted to talk about something that I know uh, you're involved in, but it's not something that would have been obvious to me, which is that there have been a lot of disagreements, including where I live, mm. about um, among educators about teaching uh, issues around the Holocaust to young children. Um, mm. I know in Germany, for example, so there's formal teaching about the Holocaust in, in high school age for high school age kids, uh, a little less for middle school, as I understand it, in elementary school age kids, nine, 10, let's say, maybe you know a few facts, but that's really it. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of your work does start with kids at that age. And I'm wondering, Ruthann, can you explain a little bit of like the logic as to why you do that? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, um, first to explain, our elementary school system goes from usually from first grade to fourth grade. In some other German states, it even goes to sixth grade. But the fourth grade, um, so first grade children are six years old. And the fourth grade, they're about 10. And we, we started our work, we realized how big the impact was on young children. Like we had in our exhibition, first visitors who were very young and we saw, wow, we can go into a dialogue and we want to learn how to do it age appropriate. Mm -hmm. What we realized, and that's also what we can read in different studies is that um, children in the age of 10, or also younger, have many, many questions about the Holocaust, many more than we thought they, or but, but than we thought they had, or which we think mm. they do. Um, if I go into an elementary school class, I can be sure that the kids ask me millions of questions about the Holocaust, and not because they already had it in school, like me as an eight-year-old saying, hi, Hitler, what did I hear? What did I learn? What led me as an eight-year-old to say something like that? I'm sure it was my surrounding. There was something in my surrounding and um, which, which I got in contact with, but I didn't understand. I didn't understand a thing. Um, we have children who watch a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. And during the Memorial Days, 
all the documentations are on TV. So that might be a point, or maybe it's a mm -hmm. remembrance stones in our um, sidewalks or whatever it is. So but you're the saying it's, they have questions, mm -hmm. right? So you're saying it's a little bit in the air. Can, can you, here's what I really, um, I've been wondering a lot about because yes, I, have a ten, I have a 10 year old daughter and one of my, yeah. it's really, why would you want to teach it to somebody that age? I understand that they already yeah. learned something, but I, I feel like you have a sort of philosophy that actually that's the right age to teach. Exactly. So, so tell us why that is. Yeah. So when is, if your 10 year old daughter has a question, I think she deserves an answer. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't want to say to any child, oh, you're interested in that? No problem. Ask me in three years again. I will sure. be happy then to answer. You know, that's like awkward. That doesn't work. So a child deserves an answer and it should be an age appropriate answer. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if we look at um, the developmental psychology um, and we look at the stage in which prejudice are being built, then we're talking about a very early age of our, our of children of growing up. If we like in the German curriculum, it's in for 14, 15 year old children or teenagers. But at that point, they're already full of prejudices. They, you know, but in the age of nine of 10 year olds, there you have a chance to have um, a, a preventive, a preventive. Yeah, that's approach, right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. And like we have a, you know, what we're doing is led by a vision. Like, of course, when big part of our vision is that we never ever want these stories to be forgotten but we want more than that we want this never ever to happen again and therefore we need an open society we need a tolerant society we need people who love each other and not hate each other and don't meet each other with stereotypes and prejudices so if we really mean what we're saying i have to say then we have to start earlier then 14, 15 year olds are too late, then we have to go in earlier. Okay. Um, could you give us maybe a little taste of like how you engage with kids that young? I sure. think just a little taste of how you get started. Um, so one is, um, I think maybe you saw it in the little video that we tell stories of survivors who we met. So if we talk with 10 year olds, for example, we would go into a classroom and tell the story of a survivor who was in the same age like the kids in this classroom were are at that point. So it's a story that they can relate to. Every survivor we ask about his and her childhood, about the time through the Holocaust and after. But with the time before, you can say, well, this is Frida and Frida had big dreams. She wanted to be a doctor or this is Rolf and his hobby was to play soccer. He liked to go to school, but he didn't like his homework. And, you know, you have, so you have a base in which you can talk. I think that's a very crucial point. And the other thing is that we start after we go into a classroom and we see which questions are there and which knowledge is there. We then start and after our warm-ups, we start with a method which is called an ordinary day. And we ask the kids, like, how does an ordinary day look for you? And then everybody, like, they're crazy about it. They raise their hands, like, oh, I get up in the morning and I have breakfast. And then I, we would say, wait, and what do you have for breakfast? Well, it's cereal. It's a bun with meat or cheese or we have Nutella here. It's a chocolate spread. All the kids yeah. love it. So, uh, or I take a shower, then what do you do next? Well, I take the bus and I go to school. Mm -hmm. Somebody else takes a bike. The next Hi. person is being brought with a car. Then they're in school. After they meet friends, they learn. Uh, after school, what do you do? Well, some go to trainings, to sports. Others play music. Others play the PlayStation yep. and like to be on their phones. So we, we, collect all of that and we put it on a big board and we just write it down mm -hmm. and after that session we tell them about the laws which were um 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 which the nazis after um uh, in january 1933 the nsdap the party from Adolf hitler was uh, elected yeah. and uh, when they 
had the power, they released more than 2,000 laws, which were huge reglementations on Jewish life. Mm -hmm. And Jewish people, and many, probably all of you know it, were not allowed to work anymore in the position they had. They were not allowed to have any possessions to, uh, they were not allowed, to, not even allowed to keep a pet. Right. Yeah. So, and then we take like approximately 15 different laws and we make the kids read them out. And the, the laws they read out are laws like Jewish people had to um, leave their homes. Jewish people had were not allowed to t use public transportation. Mm -hmm. Jewish people were not allowed to eat chocolate. Jewish people were not allowed to go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things. Jewish people were not allowed to read the newspaper or listen to the radio. And while we're reading it, we ask the kids, well, look at your ordinary day. Would anything change? And then they cross out what would change in their ordinary day. And then you get to the point that actually nothing is left over anymore. Mm -hmm. They can't go to school. There is no school anymore, but they even would not be allowed to take the bus or they don't have a car to get there, not even a bike. Mm -hmm. They can't keep their cell phone. They can't keep their PlayStation. They cannot yeah. even keep their dog or their beloved cat, you know? And that's a moment of any age, which is very powerful. Yeah. Where the kids sit there and they're very taken by that yeah. and then we go and tell one story one story of one survivor and we tell the story who this person was what the person liked to do what his or her dreams and visions were and what they had to endure um, and how they survived and that's how they learn and with that we can even say well how did it feel for Wolf when he wasn't allowed to go to school anymore? Because then the kids understand, oh, there was this law. He wasn't allowed to go to school. And here he told us in the interview how it felt for him. Got it. Sure. Uh, no, that's great. That's great. I, I would just say, uh, I think it's un understandable. And I've seen a couple of okay. comments in chat. In the United States, I think it's less clear among educators Mm -hmm. what age to start at in, in part because it's less clear who has been mm -hmm. what kids have been really exposed to kind of holocaust issues and right. questions about it but mm -hmm. i i think it's um uh well anyway it seems like you have another way to get to a, it could have been me type of moment there in mm -hmm. your explanation so i think that's very powerful um can i just ask one more thing and i'm, I'm i have interested in uh, maybe a little I'll get you to show us a little clip that you guys have. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get to the question of combating prejudice in current times? Like, what do you do to get from Holocaust issues and survivor stories to activating kids to deal with prejudice now? Well, I, I think it happens because of this personal state we had before with their own ordinary day, realizing what it would mean for them if it happened today to them. It's um, after they learn about um, a survivor's story, it happens naturally, I would say. You know, we have methods to get this, this bridge, mm -hmm. but we nearly never use them because the children and the teenagers, they have the desire to talk about it. They're like, well, I learned this today and it, and it feels hard to me to understand what happened and to see what's happening today. Like we in Germany have a white wing party in our Bundestag. How, how can that be after our history? And these are things they say, or anti-Semitism happening today. Synagogues, which need police protection because they're mm. not safe enough if they don't, you know? They, they see so that already, so and they've they already talk got about it. it. Or also, they talk about discrimination they um, have and they experience. So, um, yeah, that's the, we always say, if I may say that, we want to touch their hearts. We want to touch their head. So they, mm -hmm. they feel and they learn something about the time and today, today's time. And the um, third point we want to touch is their hand. We want to make them active ambassadors of the survivor stories 
as secondary witnesses. That's and that's right. actually then what happens, that they realize what happened, what it would mean today, that it different things are happening today, and it's to them to make a change that it doesn't happen again. Gotcha. And maybe one comment to, to, to add, if I may. Please, please, Nina, and I have, let me we all, go, on. go yeah. for it. So we also, uh, when talking about uh, anti-Semitism today, we also help to try uh, to, to uncover pattern of anti-Semitism that are not so easy to detect if you do not have the knowledge. And there are so many around us that we are not realizing. So this is, this is an approach I really like because this, we make we make them we give them the power to to uncover those patterns. We give them we give them the knowledge and the ability to do so. And this leads to so many great projects that the kids want to do and realize themselves. Great, great. Um, I'm wondering if this is that that's a good lead in to the little film you guys or the little film the film that you uh, uh, provided us. So maybe we'll watch that and then I have a follow up question for you, Nina. Um, but uh, we have, let me see how it went out. So we have a film clip, an illustrated film clip that was created by kids in your program. Uh, the subtitles were thrown on very quickly for us. So I know you had, you did a quick scramble on that and I appreciate you doing that. Uh, Craig, let's see if we can do this one. Uh, let's give it a shot. And uh, there we go. Ich heiße Leonie und bin zwölf Jahre alt. Meine Lieblingsfächer sind Sport und Mathe. Ich mag Sport sehr gerne, weil es mir Spaß macht. Friedas Lieblingsfächer waren Deutsch, Physik und Mathe. Später wollte sie Physik studieren. Bis damals die Nationalsozialisten in Warschau ihre Heimat einmarschierten und sie eine neue Klassenlehrerin bekam. An diesem Tag kam die neue Lehrerin in die Klasse, schlug das Klassenbuch auf und ging in Gedanken die Klassenliste durch. Als sie Friedas gute Noten sah und bemerkt, dass sie Jüdin war, sagte sie sofort, Juden sind dumm und gab Frieda ohne ihre Leistung zu kontrollieren jedem Fach eine Fünf. Nach der Schule ging Frieda weinend nach Hause. An Friedas Stelle hätte ich mich auch schlecht gefühlt. Ich wäre zum Direktor gegangen, aber sie hatte nicht die Möglichkeit. Tut etwas gegen Unrechtigkeit und Rassismus, denn jeder Mensch ist gleich viel wert und jeder Mensch ist anders. Sorgt dafür, dass so etwas heutzutage nicht wieder passiert. So this is a long part of the children writing down their names. Um, there is no more content to that, but it's beautiful to see the names, of course. The kids who did this were um, um, 11 and 12 years old. That was like the average of their age. You are on mute, Joe. That is a problem to be on mute. Um, <laughs> So I'm not sure if this is a good question for Nino or Ruthann, but I'm just wondering if somebody could talk very quickly, uh, like really briefly, how did students get to the point where they would make something like this? What was the, I mean, was it just they were, went through the regular second witness program, but could one of you maybe just give us a little, just a few, a few sentences of how this came about? You mean on, on, on the other things that we are doing? Sure. Uh, when you, when you just mention a little bit about this, yes. Nina, Nina, that's fine. When you mention so, just a little bit about this, and then I'll ask you about the other stuff you're doing. Sure. Fine. Okay. So just to name a few things that uh, that we're doing, it's this is this. Sorry again. That's what was what the question, right? Uh, actually, the question was first just this film. How did we end up okay. with this film? Sorry. And then what is tell us some of the other things you're doing? Just briefly, give me a, a okay, sort of maybe, sense. Maybe, Ruth Ann should comment on the film because she was involved, sure. right? Ah, sure, sure. Okay, there we go. Sorry, okay. Great. So I let's start with Ruth Ann and we'll move to Nina. Go for it. So after we do a workshop and we made the children to second witnesses, we asked mm -hmm. them like, 
what do you want to do? Like, is there something you want to do? Nobody has to do something, but it's like, there is a big ownership at that point. And then we help them, uh, like some things happen with us and a lot of things also happen by themselves. And we just say, it's you. And it's about you to find your own voice. We don't say you have to do it this way or that way. And there are so many ideas from kids, like some raise their hands and they say, we want to do a reading in school. We want to retell the stories in an own exhibition. We want to do a podcast. Many would like to do a film or gotcha. a radio okay. interview. And here, this actually was an idea from kids because they had it in an art lesson learning how to do stop motion videos. And they said like, can we do this? And we were like, sure. Sure. That makes, that <laughs> makes they sense. wrote everything down and they had the idea and um, the teachers and we helped. It was really nice, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I, I should say, I know traditionally uh, kids often write letters to the survivor that they hear about. And um, Maybe we, we'll do this and then I hear from Nina and then we better get to some questions and answers. But Ruth, and I know you have this, so I'm gonna ask you, uh, I understand you have an example of a of a of one of those letters. So let's hear that. And then I wanna hear from Nina about some of the other things you're working on. Yeah, I remember when we talked beforehand, you had said like, it would be nice to let it get a little glimpse into your work. So I hope we can give you a, this kind of- It's fine, let's, uh, hear, let's hear it. And there is, um, we have, as it was said in the introduction, we met, uh, we already worked with over 22,000 children and teenagers and approximately around 14,000 letters were written by teenagers and kids to the survivors or to their families. And one of these letters and all of these letters are just very powerful and they show what it means for the kids to meet the survivors through us and mm -hmm. what it does with them. And I brought you one, I brought one letter, letter with me today from a girl called Stira and she's a refugee. And she, when she wrote this letter- And you, and and you said a Syrian, a Syrian refugee, didn't you? A Syrian yeah. refugee, okay. exactly. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to read the story, uh, her yes. letter. She writes, hello, I'm Stira from Syria, which means I'm not German. I live in Germany since a year. I have heard a lot about your story and it was really painful hearing that you had to get through all of this. I saw also a lot in my life, people dying, bombs, leaving my house, but what you got through means a lot to me and I can understand it very well. Although you lost your family and your home, you didn't give up, which should make your wife and your children so proud of you because not everybody can endure what you endured. Your story will stay in my mind and you will stay in my heart. I hope the best for you and your family and for every Jewish, Muslim, Christian family and other. Best wishes, Dira. Thank you. Thank sure. um, I think we should move maybe to not just with the traditional, uh, traditional, but what you've been doing, particularly in schools, but it seems to me you've moved beyond into a lot of other things. You know, I know this is an area you've been very involved in. Uh, yeah. So maybe you could just give us a quick summary. I'm looking at the time and yeah. let's talk for maybe a minute or two. We should get to some questions. I know uh, um, we've got a lot of them in chat. So, but Nina, I'd love to hear, tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the other things you're doing, particularly, I think um, it's interesting, the idea that you need to get Get the attention and and um, use these things to reach people in a lot of different contexts. So, when you when you tell us a little bit about that, yes, I try to be very brief um, and happy to answer everything afterwards. So, we are beside the workshop. We are doing exhibitions. We have a brand new interactive exhibition uh, where uh, people learn or children. It's especially designed for children, and they learn stories of four survivors. Um, and they there's for example there's a mirror. So what makes it interactive? There's a mirror where you can reflect your own remembrance, your identity, your thoughts and feelings about the exhibition, and you can write it down on the wall. Uh, and there's also a time, a table, which shows a timeline, and you can take uh, wooden cubes with the uh, things that happened in the life of the survivors and put it in the right place. So it's very interactive, very, um, I think, engaging. 
And uh, there are many other things that we're doing. One is the digital storytelling. So you're all happily invited to jump on the website. I will share the link later on in the chat um, where you can find the storytellings. It is in German, but it is it has very nice illustrations, sound files of the survivors' voices and everything. And we're also doing uh, some projects for uh, people, uh, for young kids with visual and hearing impairments. Yeah. That's and, so, and so this is so that other uh, teachers, for example, can create their own exactly. uh, experience. And so that also uh, uh, people with different sorts of disabilities can also have access to the material. Great. Great. I have more questions, but I see the time and I'm sure we really want to hear questions from people who are part of the event. So I'm hoping maybe we can pull up. Miriam, are you going to ask us some questions? <clears throat> well, I saw that a lot of people had many questions and well, let's start with Kent, who was asking Holocaust education for young students has a historical basis in Germany to be effective. It's not as easy in the US. In our new Holocaust Museum in St. Louis, for example, we suggest that students under the age of 12 do not visit. The curriculum for that study doesn't begin until middle school. And it's quite the question, um, how could this be turned into something that's age appropriate? And what are your suggestions to deal with it in the United States where the background and historical situations and circumstances are so different? Um, and I, I would give it to either one of you. I guess I might ask, uh, Ruth, Ruthann, I know you have an uh, American family member and I, you know, you know pretty well also. Uh, do you want to maybe, you want to try that one, Ruthann, and then um, we'll move on to Nina for the next one? Uh, but you're muted, so let's unmute. Um, that's a why. I have been to that museum in St. Louis. I haven't been a million times to the States, but a few times and St. Louis was one of them and I've been to the museum. So nice to hear that. Um, I think it's, if you really want to work with children younger than that, but it also helps for the children older. It helps to start with personal stories. In Germany, there has been a state of an overwhelmed feeling in our youth. And that's not only by young children, but by teenagers, especially, where they say, I cannot deal with this anymore. I heard this in different subjects, because like at some point you have it a lot. And first you don't have it at all. And then suddenly you have it like in every subject. And um, the problem is that it's hard to understand in any way what happened at that time. You, we will never really understand, but we can try. <laughs> Uh, but lots of our education is based on figures and on facts and big numbers. Six million murdered Jews. Mm -hmm. And that's so hard for anybody to understand. Sure. While to go into your personal life story, that can be your approach to this age. And that's what I would say is um, try the personal approach. Actually, our idea came from Elie Wiesel who was a survivor and he said everybody who will sorry everybody who listens to a witness will become a witness and this quote from Elie Wiesel led us to the idea of secondary witnesses and I believe that if we listen to witnesses if from first hand or second hand mm -hmm. we can start to become secondary witnesses and um, when we met in Berlin, we also met Carlos Hill, a professor from Oklahoma University who is um, who studies on black studies. And he was so interested in our approach. He said, you are bearing witness. And this is something we could also do with other subjects, other topics and other and in a different history too. So you, of course, we're talking about the Holocaust, the Shoah today, but it's also an idea you could take into other ideas to take the courage to listen to people who had to go through it, to try to understand, to open your heart and your mind for it mm -hmm. and um, get emotionally involved to be sure. an ambassador for 
stories which have to be told so that history does not repeat itself. Got it. Um, uh, and I would just point out that Carlos Hill was um, uh, involved in our first event with Leo Beck, it was this past fall. Uh, so it's good to, good to hear his name. Uh, let's keep going uh, if we can. I, I know we, and I should say, I know we only have a few more minutes for during the hour. Um, I think we've arranged to make sure that our guests can stay a little longer for questions. Um, so uh, I hope those of you who are in uh, the audience and in the queue have you know put out your questions. I hope you'll be able to stick around a little longer. I think we'll be able to get a few more. Miriam, another question. Well, in a way, you already answered that one, but it's a little bit more on the specifics on how to reach teenagers. So one of our commentators was asking, what about talk, uh, it's Sylvia to be specific, but what about talking with teenagers? Any specific suggestions about getting them emotionally involved, which seems quite hard if we are competing with all of those modern media and keeping the attention span above five minutes. So yeah, I would sense. be quite interested in knowing more about that. Well, uh, why don't we start, Nina, why don't we start with you on this one? Happy to. Um, so I'd say that uh, the first part that Ruth just, uh, Ruth Ann just explained, we are trying to touch in the heart and that opens minds, opens minds, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I think this is crucial because it's so, such an important moment and it is regardless what age the, the, you know, the students, uh, the kids or the youth are. Um, and this is the same my experience with the refugee stories. And they were like in the age of 14, 15, um, and some are very cool in the beginning and say something maybe even funny or not so nice to the people that want to share their story. Uh, but when it comes to similarities, when they see, uh, oh, okay, they, they lost their families or they had to leave their home country. And you try to imagine, we, we were doing a game, uh, like a gamification element in the workshops, which was uh, plan your own flight what would you take? <laughs> and then you're thinking about, oh, can I take my mobile? Will I have the opportunity to recharge, mm -hmm. uh, to charge my mobile phone? On, on to, What else can I take? What else can I take with me? And those are the moments that we also find in the Holocaust uh, survivor stories. And that creates or builds bridges into, uh, into the daily lives uh, of the teenagers today. Gotcha. Um, I should just point out one thing that I think is worth knowing, although I'm not an education expert by any means. Uh, somewhere in the between the ages of 10 and 12, let's say, uh, kind of on the upper end, is where kids begin to be able to formulate timelines, where they actually see history as a timeline. And I would imagine that that probably plays a key role in some of the work you do, depending upon the age range. Um, Okay, how about, an, how about one more? And then um, I'll, let, I'll pause for a moment, let people who need to go, go, but we can you know, keep going for another, uh, hopefully another 15 minutes at least. Uh, May I just add one thing oh, to sure. that? Oh, please, because please. Because I think it's crucial. Yeah. Um, one thing we also do is that we take our workshops not only into schools, but also into places where teenagers like to go. Mm. And for one example, in Germany, the biggest sport is soccer like your American baseball, football, or basketball, it's soccer here. And we do our workshops also in the educational centers of the biggest soccer clubs. And these soccer clubs, the teams, they are like role models for lots of teenagers. And some of them might not be attracted to our program in the first case, but knowing, well, I can go into my stadium, I'm going to go into the educational center and I'm going to learn something well, gosh, I want to go into the stadium. So they come and then we work with them. And it's um, just so nice to see teenagers opening up, although they actually were not interested in the topic, they found their way over a different setting. So I yeah. think it's also interesting to think in different settings and not only go into classrooms, but also to take them to other that places. Makes sense. That makes sense. And, and it uh, dovetails lovely into the event that we're going to do next month with uh, Leo Goetzek Institute with actually Stefan Schirmer, who is, runs an amateur soccer club in Mainz. Um, yeah, where the, where the population that he deals with is just very different than you would see in a school setting. 
Uh, that's great. I think what we should do is we should probably keep going with a few more questions. But before that, I just want to say for anybody who I see it's just after the hour, anybody who needs to go, feel free to go. No worries. Um, but I think we would love to stick around and take a few more questions if we could. So for those of you who can stay, uh, let, let's keep going with a few more questions. Miriam, I'm, I'm sure you have a few. Well, sure, I do. I so some of them are already following up what we talked about, but one of them was quite different because it was asking for a different perspective. In that case, um, let's see, Kent was asking about, no, Mike, my fault. Um, there wasn't a name attached to it, but um, the question was, what about a family member going to Auschwitz and visiting? How can one prepare one's own family in order to do this? Wife, children. So we were talking a lot about German children who were mostly not in any way related to what happened in the Holocaust and don't have a victim's perspective. But how can you address those? And how can you help to provide some input and talk to younger generations? Uh, who would like to take that one? Your book. Wait, it's a difficult one, I know. No, uh, Ruthann? Okay, that's fine. I see the nodding. Interesting. Nina, do you feel like you want to answer? No? Okay. 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 All right. No worries. Um, it's a difficult one because of course, it's also, for me, it's a question, how old are the children? Like I said, at least say, you can talk with young children about it, but like the way we do it, we do not take them to places where mass murders happened. We bring stories of per people and we show them a picture of an elderly woman or man. And, you know, we don't have these shocking pictures which definitely are in places of Auschwitz and other concentration camps. So that is something different. Like I'm a mother myself of two young boys and um, I earlier would talk with them about the topic itself, but it would take me longer to go to concentration camps. So, but, but that's something that would be an interesting discussion. When can, when can you do that, you know? Yeah, that, and, that, um, that makes sense. But sense. to prepare them, probably I, if I would prepare my kids thinking about it to go, I would probably, I would just try to give them as much context as possible before to make them understand what happened, how did it happen, um, what led to it, what, what was the public saying about it, which walls did you have, and which place are we just now going to, and to go in to dive into it, but also if I, if you can, I probably would go through and depending on the age of the kid, I would probably go through it first and then see where I can take my child and, and tell what I want to say to the different um, places you see and ornaments you see. So I would try to lead it and also to lead my child out of it again yeah, to to in the mindset we're going in here and now we're going out and now we're free and now we can talk about it give all the feelings the room they need and all the questions and not only in the hour after but in the day after in the week after and maybe in the months after to always talk about it hopefully kind of feel this because I think if we give answers for the fear our children will feel that too so yeah. try to find a way to say, yes, this happened. And maybe also saying, and this is how I feel about it. That's what I do when I work with teenagers. Um, and they say, well, I feel sad now. I feel angry. Then I say, well, you know what? Me too. Yeah. And that's fine. You know, I've never cried as much about anything like this. I interviewed so many people who are survivors and it hurt me deeply. And this is the sadness I feel and the madness I feel about what happened and about what's happening today. And then we can also talk about it. So don't deny these feelings. Give them the room and space and say that's okay to feel like that. But also to give an idea of, okay, now we learned about that. So what can we do with it? You know, I think that's crucial to give them an idea of, okay, we can change what happened. There's unfortunately no way to do that. But um, let's think about something. 
we can do with the experience now we had we shared in yeah. Auschwitz or other places you go to. Um, can I, I just want to mention something that I think is important to know about your work, I think, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you have uh, 30, at least 30 some uh, uh, survivor stories that you've used as part of your program. Yeah. And my understanding is that you really do pay a lot of care to which story to use and with which kind of student group or something mm -hmm. like that. And so for younger kids, you're not going to, there, there's certain stories that are much more based on what happened on a series of camps, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. much less likely to use as opposed to something that's much more personal and has kind of a more of a, a strong element of where that child was, of mm -hmm. an experience and where they went to. As, um, anyway, I think that's important. And, and I actually, yeah. let, me, let me follow up with a question. Um, maybe I'll throw it at Nina this time, uh, although either one of you could probably answer, which is, um, you know, uh, Wine the Circle, especially the Obermeyer Awards, and Leo Beck both focus on how Jews lived. Uh, not just how they died, or like really mostly how they lived. Um, and I guess I was just wondering, look, we're talking about a topic, survivor stories, that you might think of as more about the, you know, one versus the other. Um, can you talk about how, how did the Jews lived fit, fits into your work? And I, I was going to ask Nina only because we could ask you a few more questions, but uh, I, I feel like this is a good one for either one of you. So, sorry, I lost the screen. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, so the question was how we, uh, how do we involve or focus on Jewish life today in the stories? And I think it is also again the bridge building because we are talking about the uh, Jewish tradition, Jewish lives, and um, holidays and. Uh, everything from the past, from the childhood memories, uh, and also how uh, how do the Jew, the Jewish people that we interviewed live today? So which is, which reflects to what Judaism means today and how it is lived and uh, filled with life and uh, actions. And so, and, and I think I haven't been to too many workshops, but from the questions that I'm uh, reading, in the documentations um, young people are interested in because they compare to what they know about uh, their religion and uh, their religious life and uh, so yeah i think this is the the part uh, or the the moment when we uh, talk about jewish life today and also if you <laughs> if you talk about judaism and uh, you hear about it as a child and then you go out you see it, you see it mm. everywhere, and you, you, but you are able to detect it then because you've seen symbols or you hear, you heard about um, mosques, or, uh, not mosques. Uh, no, synagogue, it's okay. <laughs> Synagogues, it's, um, very sorry, um, uh, and everything. And now you know, you know what that building is maybe, uh, you, and you, yeah. you, have, you can develop a further interest. It. Makes sense, thank you, Nina. Um, uh, I assume we have time just for a few more. Miriam, you want to try another one? Well, um, one of the question was about how do the parents react when you are teaching children, educating them and really activating them in order to develop own projects? I just laughed because uh, just recently I got such a beautiful email forwarded from a teacher and it made me so happy and it was a mother writing to the teacher and it said something like she said dear Mr. Schmidt thank you so much for getting the slight Zeugen the secondary witnesses into school my 14-year-old boy usually never talks about school. I can ask him as much as I want to. I never hear a word. And after your project, my boy was not stopping anymore. Like he went on and on and on and on and on. And she was so grateful for that. And um, I mean, of course, it's just one very positive example. It just made us very happy. And these are reactions which we get. Um, that parents are happy about it and thankful that there is an approach and that um, they see that it has a meaning to their children and they and they actually open up about it. But 
I also want to say, of course, there are also other feelings, like some parents are scared, like, are we going to traumatize their children? Like, if we go into elementary schools, we um, often do a, a informational evening before the workshop starts, a few weeks before, to talk with the parents and talk about the questions they have and maybe the fears that they have and to just tell them how we do it and yeah that our approach is not to traumatize their kids so that's also very important and uh, third there are also prejudices among our parents so there are also parents who say like well we think this story has to be closed and we have talked about it enough and now it's long enough after World War II and the Holocaust now, will you please stop it? So you also have that. But um, fortunately, the positive reactions are bigger than the negative. And um, I find it always just important to talk about it. If it's negative, if it's fear, if whatever it is, um, our informational events help. They make it more, more work. <laughs> I have to say, like last year, we worked with more than 6,000 children and teenagers and um, so it has been a struggle for us we really have to find foundings uh, donations to keep up this work we cannot only do it on a volunteer base anymore as we used to mm -hmm. but um, with the the number of children we are reaching now year by year and also necess necessary events like these like inform parents involved parents it has gotten more and more complex. I also want to say that, but I think it's worth it. Great. Um, uh, thank you for that, Ruthann. Remember, I think we have time maybe for one more. You got a good last question for us? Well, I guess it's in a way a continuation of what we've been just discussing. The question is whether you are also tackling current issues or, for example, the current refugee situation, and how do you do so if you do so? Um, maybe we can start with Nina this time. Yes. Since I know you've, you've been very keyed on refugee issues, you know, throughout your career. So the question was, how do we reflect on this one within the workshops and within our work? Well, yeah, within uh, your work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So first of all, um, what Ruth and Ruth and just said is that we inform the parents and we also always ask the teachers, are there kids in the class? that have experienced flight or seeking refuge, uh, had to seek refuge, um, or uh, does any uh, have any other things that we should keep in mind when doing our workshop. This is the first. And at the same time, um, we we did a we, we did a cooperation with the refugee project that uh, I was running before, and we shared in an event the story of a survivor and invited a girl from Syria. She sh uh, shared her story, and there were so many similarities. It was it was seventy years in between, but there were so many si similarities. Even the path they took, it was the other direction, but we created two maps and put them. Um, together and there have been so many locations where have both been uh, on their way uh, out and so I think there there are many things that we uh, there are many similarities that we find and at the same time we also try to try to uh, involve this target group this group of children um, and create material for them for example, an easy language. So it's um, if they are not uh, German speakers or just learning German, then uh, we have material for them. And we also cooperate with other organizations um, mm -hmm. on, in dealing with refugee topics, working together with refugees and try to uh, build great projects around those topics, places, people. Great, great. Uh, thank you for that, Nina. Um, I think, uh, well, anyway, I want to, I just want to um, say thank you to our speakers today, uh, and to the, especially to, uh, to Ruth Ann and to uh, Nina, and uh, to Leo Beck for partnering with us, and, and of course for Miriam for helping us out as well. Um, I encourage people who are curious uh, about Zweitzeugen to take a look at their website, which I believe was in chat, 
If you're interested about Widen the Circle, please come to our website, widenthecircle.org. Uh, you can also see more material about Zweitzeug in there. Um, on April 19th, we will have another conversation with an Obermeyer Award winner that will feature Stefan Schirmer, uh, one of the leaders of Ente Baghdad, which is an amateur soccer club outside of Mainz. They do really good remembrance work. They do really great work with refugees. So this is a good lead into that. Um, and we'll share a link as well for people to register. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful questions and thanks, thanks again to Ruth Ann and to Nina for their insights and to everybody who asked interesting questions. Um, thank you for joining us.